Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. I am excited to start National Women's History Month with tonight's program about the Blackwell Sisters. I don't normally get personal in these introductions, but I may have done a book report a long time ago about Elizabeth Blackwell. And then I went to a college in Geneva, New York, and was honored to live in a dorm named after the first American female doctor for two years and saw her picture every day. So when I saw that the doctors Blackwell told the story of not just Elizabeth, but also her sister, Emily, I jumped to request the author for you. Since then, Janice Nomura has been receiving great reviews for this book and is here today to share their story in a discussion with Dr. Perry Class. Janice Nomura is a historian whose previous book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back, was one of the New York Times top 50 nonfiction books of 2015. Her essays and book reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Smithsonian, among other publications. Perry Klass is a profession, professor of journalism and pediatrics at New York University, co-director of NYU Florence, and national medical director of Reach Out and Read. She wrote, a Good Time to be Born, How Science and Public Health Gave Children a Future, about the fight against child mortality that transformed parenting, doctoring, and the way we live. She also writes the weekly column, The Checkup, for the New York Times. Janice and Perry, take it away. If you have any familiarity with the Blackwell name, it's probably Elizabeth Blackwell, and the phrase first woman doctor pops up right after that. She was the first woman in America to receive a medical diploma in 1849. Her sister Emily followed her to become the third woman to receive an American medical degree in 1854. Together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. Now, unlike Jennifer just now, I had never heard of the Blackwells until five years ago. Um, this despite the fact that I had grown up in New York, the city where they practiced, attended a proudly feminist all girls school from the age of five, was the math science kid at that school, graduated with the full intention of studying medicine, although that didn't last. Um, how could I, how had I never heard of them? How was that even possible? So I was curious, I went looking for them. And I discovered that the Blackwell story tends to be easiest to find on the children's biography shelf. Um, books that look very similar to this one. There's always a slim, attractive, well-dressed young woman with a stethoscope bending solicitously over a grateful patient. This is a chapter book from the 1940s. This is the middle grade version in my daughter's school library once upon a time. Um, again, stethoscope, nice clothes. Grateful Patient. Um, here's the picture book version, a little younger, perkier, but there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting until she grows up. Um, it's always Elizabeth, never Emily. Um, the black clothes looked like this. Um, they were never photographed holding stethoscopes. Uh, and even if they had been in the 1840s and 50s when they were as young and slim as the women on the covers of those picture books, Stethoscopes look more like this, um, the, still the monaural ones in use then. So the more I looked, the more it was clear that these children's versions were sanitized. They were a little bit um, polished away. All the contradictions were polished away. Um, I wanted, the more I, the more I investigated and when I finally got into the archives and started listening to Elizabeth and Emily's voices as they wrote them uh, in journals and, and letters, um, I became eager to reintroduce the Blackwells, both of them, not just Elizabeth, with all of their complexity because they were complicated women. Um, I wanted to reintroduce them with their ragged edges, not just as perky, pretty, adorable picture book heroines. Um, I wanted to know their whole story, not just what fits in a picture book. So what was that story? Um, briefly. The Blackwells, uh, eight out of the nine of them were born in Bristol, England. They came to this country in 1832 um, as children. They were the sons and daughters of a paradox. Their father was a sugar refiner and an abolitionist. Think about that for a sec. Um, he was a man who had profited from 
become an industry dependent on enslaved labor and spent all his free time campaigning against enslaved labor. Um, however, he was a dreamer and he dreamed of finding a way to base his industry in sugar beets that could be grown in the North without enslaved labor instead of cane. Um, and on the strength of that dream, he moved his entire family uh, from Bristol to New York in 1832 and then all the way out to the remote frontier town at that point in 1838 of Cincinnati, um, hoping to find a way to make sugar out of beets. He got to Cincinnati and before they had really even finished unpacking, he died broke, leaving a widow and nine children. Um, his final lesson was that a husband is no guarantee of security and none of his five daughters ever married. Elizabeth on the left there was born in 1821. She was voraciously brilliant, um, socially quite awkward, blessed with a healthy sense of self-worth. Um, she admired the transcendentalist writer and editor, Margaret Fuller, who in the mid 1840s, as Elizabeth came of age, had published a bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century, in which she argued that humanity was not going to achieve the next level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own powers and claimed their independence. She argued that women could be anything they wanted to be. It was a matter of effort and talent, not sex. Women could be sea captains if they liked. And Elizabeth reading this in her late teens was captivated by this idea. And she began to think of herself as someone whose life could prove Margaret Fuller's point, whose life could lead humanity toward the light. So how to prove this point? She chose medicine not because she liked science or felt called to take care of people. She thought sickness was a form of weakness. She thought bodily functions were disgusting. Um, she chose medicine strategically because it was an unusually clear way to prove this point about what women could do. Um, medicine was redefining itself at this point, both scientifically and institutionally. Um, hitherto, it had been more of a trade, the trade of midwives or barber surgeons. Um, increasingly, it was a profession, a profession of men who were credentialed by virtue of having earned a diploma from a medical school. And increasingly, there were medical schools in America. Um, however, as this cartoon from 1825 suggests, um, medical school was not the incredibly rigorous challenge it is today. Um, medical school at that point was two identical consecutive 16 week terms of lectures, period, uh, with some examinations at the end. Um, and Elizabeth thought to herself, if I can find my way to a medical school and attend all the lectures and pass all the examinations, who can say that I am not as qualified as any man to be a doctor? Um, so that's what she decided to do. She knew, given how not rigorous medical school was and how brilliant she was, she was very aware of her own intellectual powers. She knew that if she could, if she could find her way there, she was likely to be able to succeed in the school. So at the age of 26, Elizabeth won admission to a tiny rural medical school called Geneva Medical College in Geneva, New York, in the Finger Lakes, at the top of Seneca Lake. Um, on the left, there is the medical building as it was. On the right, the spot where it used to be. Um, that campus has evolved into Hobart and William Smith Colleges, Jennifer's alma mater. Um, she got herself a place there pretty much by accident after a sheaf of rejections from other more prominent schools. Um, that's a good story that you'll have to read about in the book. Um, and then she graduated at the top of her class in 1849. Um, she needed some practical training at that, po at that point because as I say, uh, medical school consisted of lectures. Maybe you got to do a little dissection, but you didn't spend any time with patients. So like many American medical graduates, um, Elizabeth went to Europe to receive some medical polish. Um, she found her way to Paris where she actually enrolled again as a student in this public maternity hospital called La Maternité uh, in an old convent. I got to climb around in it. This is a picture that we took when we visited. Um, at La Maternité, with a, uh, a patient population of, of very poor women, because if you had any money at all, you delivered at home, um, she began to uh, make that connection that informed her later career between poverty and medicine. Um, she saw a huge volume of obstetric cases, 
And she underwent a, uh, a health crisis that changed the shape of her career, if not its direction. Um, she contracted an infection from an infected newborn um, that resulted in the loss of one eye. Um, if you actually look closely at this portrait, you can see that there's an asymmetry in her gaze. She wore a glass prosthetic for the rest of her life and never really talked about it. So there were plenty of people who didn't realize that she had such a disability. Uh, did she go home for a while to convalesce? No, she regained her health and went on to London to continue her training at another public hospital called St. Bartholomew's. Um, in London, thanks to mutual friends, she made a fateful friendship. Uh, she was introduced to Florence Nightingale, who in 1851, when they met, was not yet Florence Nightingale, the lady with the lamp, the heroine of the Crimean War. Um, she was a young woman chafing against her wealthy family's insistence that she get married and settle down. Um, she encountered uh, Elizabeth like a like a like a in rapture because here was a woman from America who had left her family behind, ignored the the requirements of, that she get married, and was. Um, drapesing all over Europe studying medicine. Elizabeth Blackwell, I like to think, was something of a catalyst to Florence Nightingale, some, uh, someone who was proof that a woman could pursue a career in health. Um, however, despite their initial rapturous communion, um, the two women never really saw eye to eye on the proper role of women in medicine. Although um, Elizabeth did go on to use a lot of Florence Nightingale's ideas about hygiene um, and prevention, she firmly believed that her role in medicine was as a doctor and Florence Nightingale insisted that women's role was as nurses. Elizabeth finished her training in Europe, returned to New York where she assumed she would have a thriving private practice because what woman wouldn't want to confide her intimate ailments to a woman doctor? Well, it was harder than that. Uh, why? Well, partly because the very phrase female physician in 1851 when Elizabeth got back to New York um, meant someone like this woman in the caricature, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, Madame Rastel, here depicted as a baby eating demon. Um, female physician did not mean bright young woman with a medical degree. It meant someone who operated on the wrong side of the law, in the shadows, with scandal. Um, nice women didn't say, I'm going to my woman doctor now, um, and no patients showed up. Meanwhile, in this sort of dismaying moment, um, Elizabeth had anointed her sister, Emily, to follow her into medicine. She knew that medicine as a woman was going to be a steep and lonely path, and she wanted company. She thought more highly of her own siblings than anyone else in the world, so she chose her next youngest sister, who happened to be the most brilliant of her sisters, to follow her. And Emily, uh, it turned out, was actually more naturally drawn to the science and the practice of medicine and turned out to be the more brilliant practitioner. She had at least as much trouble getting into a medical school as Elizabeth did because Elizabeth's success caused most medical schools to bar their doors ever more firmly against women. Um, we're not gonna have any of that around here, most of them thought. Uh, she struggled at, even harder than Elizabeth and eventually got her degree in 1854 from what is now Case Western and then called Cleveland Medical College. Uh, she went on to Edinburgh to get her medical training and um, apprenticed herself to the flamboyant and very prominent physician James Young Simpson in Edinburgh. Um, he, a bit of a showman, I think, liked the shock value of having a female assistant um, but at the same time respected her skills and taught her a great deal. Um, Elizabeth and Emily were both quite well trained by now, but they still came in for the kind of snark that you can see in this cartoon from the London satiric newspaper Punch. This is right at the end of Emily's tenure in Edinburgh. It's meant to show Emily dressed in the scandalous bloomer costume of the women's rights activists with a ridiculous hat and a rather mannish expression, uh, profile, uh, peering through her spectacles at the only patient who will consult her, a lapdog, um, being clutched in the arms of a more conventionally feminine young lady. Um, the accompanying article said something like, yeah, women doctors are great. They'll be able to take care of their husbands and children better than most. Um, Elizabeth and Emily, though, were very good at ignoring this kind of silliness. Um, together, back in New York, they opened the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children in 1857 in a building that still stands on the corner of Bleecker and Crosby Streets in Greenwich Village. 
on the left as it was and on the right as it is. Um, their intention was not just to give poor women an opportunity to, to consult uh, doctors of their own sex, but also to provide a place for the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates to train, not to have to go to Europe to get the practical training they needed. Um, later, they, after the Civil War, they went on to open a women's medical college of the New York Infirmary, even though they hadn't really set out to do that, they didn't really believe in separate medical education for women, but since none of the men's colleges were letting women in, and, this, and, and a few new women's medical colleges they thought were terribly inferior, they decided to found one that served women only, but at a higher level even than the men's colleges they had attended. Um, that was just their professional lives. Uh, per personally, they're just as interesting. Both sisters adopted daughters. Um, Emily Blackwell spent the last several decades of her life with a female partner, the surgeon Elizabeth Cushier. Um, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, Lucy Stone, a suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, the first woman to be ordained as a minister in this country. Um, interestingly, even though they were now part of the family, Elizabeth and Emily didn't necessarily agree with these very prominent feminists, um, especially over things like suffrage. Um, Elizabeth was particularly vocal about her opinion that suffrage was not the right first priority of the women's movement. Um, in fact, Elizabeth and Emily had a pretty dim view of women at every level, which also adds some interest to this story, a little unexpected. Um, even though they built the uh, Women's Medical College and the New York Infirmary together, Elizabeth and Emily also disagreed with each other over the proper role of a female physician. Um, Elizabeth, partly thanks to her, um, her eye injury, uh, was more interested in public health, in moral reform, in being a teacher armed with science. Emily was more interested in being a physician, surgeon, and medical professor as talented as any man. Um, once their in institutions were founded, and with some relief, they parted ways and spent the last 40 years of their lives on different continents. Elizabeth went back to Europe and to England, where she had always wanted to return uh, to pursue policy and public health. And Emily remained in New York uh, and ran their institutions with great skill for the last four decades. Um, I find that this is a, an, an excellent moment for the Blackwell story, not just because all we do is think and talk about public health, but also because we're also thinking and talking about female leaders in a new way since the inauguration. Um, these were interesting female leaders. They're, they're unexpected. Uh, they, are, they do not conform to the conventional, the, the conventions of the feminist icon in the ways, in ways that we want them to always. Um, they were complicated, prickly, imperfect, very real heroines. And I think those kinds of heroines are the kind that change the world. So thank you for listening. Um, that gives you a sense of the story. I'm going to unshare my screen and let's chat. Hi, Perry. Hi, Janice. Thank you so much for taking us through the story and for giving us the images which help us picture these remarkable, extraordinary, fascinating women. I'm just going to lift up your book and hold it and just say to people that this is, it's a wonderful book. I just, I get to say that. It's really, it's fascinating. It's delightful. It's unexpected. It's, it's un, I went to medical school. I had, I had spoken at the medical school that claims her on Elizabeth Blackwell Day, and I had no idea how interesting she was, no idea about Emily, and no idea about their, their fascinating family. So I wondered if we could start with the family, sure. since they are sisters. And you, you touched on both the eccentricity and the complexity of a family whose income is founded in, in the sugar business, but to, to talk a little bit about the way that they grew up, but also about the relations among all of those siblings as sure. they supported each other. Yeah, the Blackwells were really a, a tribe. They were a clan. Um, 
for many reasons. In England, even before they had emigrated, they were dissenters from the Church of England, which meant they were already slightly outside the mainstream of society. As th there was this issue with their father being an idealist and a sugar refiner. Um, the, 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 the story goes that the Blackwell children raised with this idea of activism um, wanted to participate. So they said, we're not gonna have sugar in our tea because sugar is based on enslaved labor not really grasping the fact that the tea that they were drinking had been paid for by the sugar industry, but you know, they were trying. Um, then they emigrated, they, they you know, were outsiders by virtue of being new arrivals to New York. Then they left New York and went all the way out to Cincinnati, which was really on the edge of the known world in 1838. Um, then their father dies, so they're orphaned and in a financially precarious state, which makes them turn even more inward toward each other. and. All of them, the other interesting legacy that their father left was that he educated all of them at the same level, boys and girls. So all they did in this little island, this little bubble of their family was read and discuss and think. Um, it was a very sort of heady intellectual atmosphere of their family. There were nine of them. Um, they, as I said, thought very highly of each other and kind of drove each other crazy. So they were very strong personalities, especially the, the, the girls. Um, so as they reached adulthood and became able to move independently of each other, they were rarely in the same place at the same time, which was the most incredible gift to a biographer because there were thousands and thousands of letters um, from all of them to all of them. So I didn't just have Emily and Elizabeth writing what was happening to each of them. I had, their, I had them writing about and to each other and I had their siblings writing to them and then talking about them on the side. So for every life event, there were multiple perspectives, um, some, you know, back channeling, um, and you could get um, kind of a Rashomon kind of sense of, of braiding various truths together to get a fuller picture. Um, I, it, they were a wonderful family to work, to, to work on and with. Um, the old, the thing that you'll hear biographers say is that unless you have um, unless you feel like you're drowning in material, you probably don't have enough, um, which is true. And in this case, I was drowning, which was both great and felt like drowning a lot of the time. So um, uh, it, was an, it was an embarrassment of riches. Listening to you talk about them and reading have you written about them, they remind me at times of some of the other eccentric, progressive, brilliant, um, families that I think of in the 19th century, like the Beechers and the Stowes or like the Alcotts, families where the eccentricity runs really deep and, and the connections are also very, very strong. That's right. I mean, when you mentioned the Beechers and the Stowes, they were actually friends. They all lived in Cincinnati. They were all uh, in Cincinnati, sure. They, they influenced each other. Um, they were they were friendly. Henry Ward Beecher helped launch the infirmary when it opened. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, commented early on when Elizabeth first decided to pursue medicine that she didn't think it was a very good idea. She thought it was <laughs> too hard. Um, but yeah, there, there's and 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 the 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 Blackwells are also interesting. Um, as these other families were in that they intersected with a lot of the most prominent figures of the day. So there's this kind of like, I, I, somebody described it as kind of a Forrest Gump-like uh, affect where, you know, in every chapter, there's somebody, there's a bold-faced name. There's Florence Nightingale, there's Lady Byron, there's Abraham Lincoln, there's William Lloyd Garrison. You know, they're, they're all hanging out together, um, partly because the, the world of, of, the intellectual world of the 1840s was limited. Um, but partly because they, you know, they were all thinking at the edge of progressive thought. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship that they had to clinical medicine? Um, especially, I know that you sort of talked about how it wasn't the thing that mattered most to Elizabeth, um, but, and maybe more to Emily, but I have to tell you that when you said that about how she was brilliant, but maybe socially awkward, it reminded me of a lot of people who I went to medical school with and um, to about some of the things which are sometimes said about people in medicine. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Elizabeth um, really struggled with human connection. She, she did not, um, she wasn't good. She was good at a lot of things. 
which which made it even harder to be not very good at connecting to other people emotionally. Um, and I think she felt that in herself quite early on, even as a 17 year old, she's talking about herself as an old maid, which is kind of ex extraordinary when you think about it. Um, so medicine was this moral quest that she decided on, um, which gave her this wonderful out. Like, I, I don't have time for, for marriage and motherhood. I have a quest. Uh, now I don't have to worry about the fact that I, the whole getting intimate with somebody scares the, everything out of me. Um, I have I have a quest. Um, once she embarked on this quest, even though it wasn't history and philosophy, which was her first love, um, she discovered that it was quite enough of an intellectual challenge to stimulate her. And there's and there are interesting passages where she starts to um, kind of surprise herself by the extent to which she admires the elegance of the anatomy of the wrist or something like that. Um, and she starts to kind of get into it. Um, as she gets into it though, an interesting thing happens, which is that, sorry, you're muted, Perry. Sorry, I had muted myself accidentally. <laughs> no, go on, um, I was agreeing. <laughs> um, it, as she gets into medicine, she um, an interesting thing happens, which is that instinctively she questions a lot of what the establishment says is proper medical practice um this Such is as, uh, <laughs> because, the, because the next thing i'm going to ask you is about the background of medical practice right i mean this this interestingly they the blackwells come into medicine at the moment i mean pr pretty much at the exact moment where it shifts dramatically in every way um because up until that time, it has looked a lot like it looked in antiquity. There's no way to look inside the body. There aren't that many effective medicines. Um, when someone is ill, you basically do things to them to make things come out of them until the bad thing comes out too, or else they come die. On, go ahead, do it. Tell people what some of those things are. <laughs> Talk a little about, about the, the medical world. It's horrifying, right? You could be bled, which in some cases was like, a quart of blood being taken out of you to, to reduce inflammation. You could be blistered, which involved basically burning your skin until a bubble, you know, a, a blister formed, which would let out the pus with the infection. You could be given an emetic to, to vomit. You could be given an enema. You could be given um, mercury, which was both poisonous and caused you to salivate so much that they thought maybe that would get out whatever was in. Um, it was a horrifying, in a pharmaceutical array. And basically doctors tried these remedies one after the other until the patient either got better or died. Um, this is how it had always been. Now, slowly people were asking questions about things as simple as fresh air and cold water. Um, and then gradually, in, right as, they're as the Blackwells are coming to medicine, there are things like antisepsis, um, washing your hands. Um, and of course, Florence Nightingale is also coming at this from the point of view of, of hygiene rather right. than... Right. Let's prov like, like all, the, all, the, all the soldiers are not dying of wounds, they're dying of disease. Let's keep them clean so they don't get sick. Um, ideas about germ theory we're following soon after. So you see Elizabeth getting excited about medicine, starting to question what came before, but not able to reject it entirely because she's trying to break into this establishment. You can't you can't call out a whole tradition and expect to be accepted by it in the same breath. So she had to be careful there. And at the same time, she's curious about all these new ideas and some of the new ideas that turn out not to be good ideas, things like the water cure or um, magnetism, mesmerism, um, phrenology even, but she's trying them out. She's very open-minded and she's trying to take the take what is better and discard what is bad and it's part of why she's very grateful when she finally is able to found her own institution because in her own institution she can do what she called committing heresy with intelligence which meant nobody was watching to say no you can't do it that way if she was in her own institution she could try out the things that she instinctively realized were a better idea so a lot going on at the same time 
Um, I do remember reading in your book about the some connection she feels when she goes to Paris, when she's studying at the maternité, and she begins to feel a little bit more like a doctor, like somebody who actually can take care of patients. And that was also moving, though, even though even though it didn't turn out to be the main focus for her. Right. I mean, she she suddenly, you know, I think she's as someone who has a very high opinion of herself and her talents, it was hard for her to graduate from medical school, find herself in a hospital setting and not know what to do. And it's hard for all of us. It's the most <laughs> classic feeling of, you know, of, 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 of the, the fourth year medical student or the first year intern. Right. Right. Um, maybe that's why I identified. Right. You see her writing home to Emily saying, you know, you know, it's hard, for, it's hard for me to admit, but I've, I, I saw someone bled today for the first time, you know, this was something she'd been reading about for years, but she'd never seen it. Um, and at La Maternité, given that it was a maternity hospital um, for the purpose of training midwives, she actually enrolled there as a student, even though she had an MD. Um, she enrolled there as a student specifically because it would be an incredible volume of obstetric cases to watch and work with. And in that context, she was able to really get in there and start to feel a little bit of confidence about what it was, it, what, what it was that she was trying to do. So I know you talked a little about the general state of medicine in the middle of the 19th century. You want to talk a little bit about women's health and maternity. You said earlier on that if you had women who had money would have, would not be giving birth in a hospital. And want to talk a little bit about what um, maternal, fetal, you know, where things stood for the healthcare of women. Well, you know, one of the reasons you didn't want to give birth in a hospital is that the doctors who were helping you give birth uh, had generally not washed their hands since the last patient, or if they had performed an autopsy, hadn't washed their hands after that. Um, you know, childbed fever, puerperal fever was was rampant in these settings because there was no there was no understanding of of hygiene. So you you could you could catch all kinds of things. Um, you're the expert on maternal fetal health in the 19th century. You know, um, I should, I should, I, I'm, I'm frustrated because last time we, we, we got to talk together like this, I had your book up here, but I just lent it to someone. <laughs> so I don't have it. But Perry has written a wonderful book called A Good Time to Be Born about the, the, the advances in child mortality, the, the, the declines in child mortality and the, and the advances in child health over the last stretch. So well, I, I was interested as a pediatrician thinking about taking care of children, but your book and what you're talking about makes me think about what it must have been like to be a female physician watching women go through pregnancy, watching women take the risk of childbirth, um, and you know whatever sense of identification or of worry you would have had with them in a setting when, as you said, there was nothing you could do about purple fever, which was was rampant, and and um, at least at the beginning of their careers, nothing you could do about the pain, not much you could do about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interestingly, you know, Elizabeth really, um, it was Emily who really, um, you know, watched women in labor and thought to herself, how can I make this better for women? Huh. Um, I, I, you can see her, you know, I, when she's training in Edinburgh with a, a man, with a, with a physician who isn't himself an obstetrician and gynecologist, and she's watching women with uterine prolapse from too many pregnancies or, you know, all the other ills that come with, 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 with unrestricted pregnancy, um, unmanaged family size. Um, and she's saying, you know, does this work? Would, 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 what would make this easier? Is this surgery? It, it, there were some horrifying surgeries, which I probably shouldn't get into because people are, haven't had dinner yet. Um, you know, is, 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 does this make sense? How do we do this better? Whereas Elizabeth, I think, was, um, thinking more not about healing individuals but about healing humanity about about raising up hum humans in a general sense rather than in a specific patient sense so i was going to ask you to talk about both of those periods both the period that they spend in new york and their institution and maybe a little bit about your experience tracking the the situation the place um 
the places where they went, the traces that you can still find in New York. And then I was going to ask you to talk about those years they spend apart and what becomes of Elizabeth during those decades in England, what, what her reputation is, what her causes are, and what, what Emily's doing in New York. But, but I think maybe uh, I'm now, I'd actually love to hear a little more about the process of tracking the letters and the... the, right. the Right, so, so there are two huge collections of Blackwell papers. One is up at uh, Radcliffe at the Schlesinger Library for Women's History, uh, and the other is at the Library of Congress. Um, so those, was, those were the two places to start, obviously. Um, and then there are, there are smaller collections in other places. There's some at Columbia, there's some at Hobart and William Smith. Um, and then, you know, when, once, you've, once you've immersed yourself in the letters, the, the fun part that I find the, the, even more fun than, than finding treasures in archives is, is walking around in the footsteps, um, following the descriptions that you've read in these letters. I was here, I was there, then I went here, then I went there, I did this. If you can actually track those things and, and, and if any of the buildings still exist, you can stand there and say, okay, this is where she was standing when she had that thought. All of a sudden, your sense of, of how that would feel has a new dimension to it. So I did a lot of, of, of um, following them around. I went to Bristol and London and Paris and Edinburgh and Geneva, New York, not Switzerland. Um, and then, you know, right here in New York. So, you know, the, the infirmary building that I showed you is still there. And uh, I, I was very fortunate. I, I, mean, I, I ended up befriending the woman um, who, who has her sort of headquarters in that building. And she uh, allowed me to come and sit at her work. She's a jewelry designer. She actually designed this necklace. Um, and she allowed me to sit at her work table and write the chapter on the infirmary within the building where it was founded. So those kinds of moments where, you know, sort of the veil between past and present feels very thin. Uh, I find the most inspiring um, when you're trying to tell a story from the past. That's wonderful. And to be honest, um, reading the book has changed my sense of lower Manhattan a little bit and, you know, added another layer to all the history. Talk, talk a little bit about Emily's, you know, four decades here, Elizabeth's four decades in England when they're right. not together. Right. Are they still writing back and forth? They are, although I think they parted with some relief. Um, I think Elizabeth really wasn't interested in the day-to-day -day running of, of two institutions, the college and the infirmary. She was such an idealist. She was, what, what fueled her was going on to the next challenge. What, what can we do now? What, what, what needs, what needs my, my help? What cause can I, can I spearhead? Um, running a hospital and a, and a college, I mean, the bureaucracy of that was deeply unattractive to her. Huh. Um, and she also felt like she knew that she wasn't great at that kind of leadership. And she, she had a sense that the, these institutions would thrive better if she just took off. Um, so she went to, to England where women were starting to um, get more of a foothold in medicine. People like Elizabeth Garrett Anderson and Sophia Jex Blake, who were the, um, the, the pioneering women physicians in England, um, who, with whom Elizabeth had intersected earlier in their training. And so she sort of thought, oh, I'll go there and I'll mentor them. Um, and she got there and discovered somewhat to her dismay that they kind of, her, their attitude toward her was sort of, oh, hi, Elizabeth Blackwell, we got this, You're, we're good. Um, <laughs> Uh, and they weren't quite as willing to collaborate as she had maybe hoped, which was kind of ironic because she was not a great collaborator herself. They had sort of learned too well from her example of leading without necessarily team building. Um, she did a lot of writing and lecturing when, in, in those last years in England. Um, uh, and, and I think felt a little bit frustrated that she had never really achieved the global celebrity that someone like Florence Nightingale had. Um, meanwhile, Emily, who really was not nearly as interested in recognition as Elizabeth was, um, just got on with the work and did it really well. Um, she she trained, she trained, I mean, her attitude toward being a woman in medicine was, it's not enough to be a woman in medicine. It, my job is to, is to make sure that I, that there are legions of women doctors after me. Um, that, that's my job is to find them and train them and, and set them on the path. Um, and she, 
had no ego in it. When, when, the, when, when women started to be admitted to the men's medical colleges like Johns Hopkins and Cornell in around 1899, Emily immediately said, okay, we're shutting the women's medical college down. It, it has no need to exist anymore. We only opened it because women couldn't get an excellent medical education at the women's medical colleges. And now it's time has passed. We're, and, and, and she shut its doors. So there was none of that kind of um, uh, legacy building. In fact, I think she worked so hard at, um, at leading the institutions that they had founded that she basically upheld her sister's legacy at the expense of her own. I don't think Elizabeth Blackwell would be so well remembered if those institutions hadn't prospered. Um, and no one remembers Emily. <laughs> so well, you've changed know. that. <laughs> the last question I'm going to ask you is, would you talk a little more about their personal lives, maybe about whether religion played a role? You mentioned Emily's partnership. Um, you mentioned daughters they adopted. Would you talk a little more about that side of their lives? Yeah, I, they were very interesting and different. Um, I think in terms of religion, Elizabeth was much more driven by a sense of the divine and her role as one of the elect. Uh, she talks like that. Um, she, she, she talks in, in stunningly confident terms about her relationship with God and how they're really just colleagues. Um, it kind of, it, it sets, your, sets you back a little bit sometimes. Well, there, there are many jokes about doctors in which that kind of connection is suggested. <laughs> playing God. Um, no, she, she wasn't playing. <laughs> um, yes, both, both sisters adopted daughters, although in very different ways. Elizabeth adopted a little girl at the age of about six um, from an orphanage on Randall's Island here in New York, um, a little Irish girl named Kitty, who she brought into her household as sort of part daughter, part servant, part fan, part companion. And, um, and this, this woman grew up to be um, Elizabeth's acolyte. She was she was there to be Elizabeth's companion. And here, this she she was never invited to call Elizabeth anything other than Doctor Elizabeth. She was not invited to call her mother. Um, and you know, here this 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 ward of a woman who had made a huge stride in a in a in a profession was the child was never invited to either consider a profession or marriage. Her job was to be at Elizabeth's side. Um, Emily in, in, in adopted an infant later um, who did call her mom and who signed her letters with kisses and eventually married and gave her four grandsons. So that was a much more conventional um, family kind of feeling. Emily was just, I think, better at human connection all around. Um, and then Emily did have a partner, um, Elizabeth Cushier, who had started as a student at the medical college and became a surgeon, um, an excellent one because the Blackwells didn't respect anybody who wasn't excellent. And though the two of them, um, you know, became domestic partners. And I think, you know, although I don't have any letters that are explicit about the nature of their relationship, it was very clear that they were each other's most important person. Um, and uh, I think I, I, when I write, I depend on the sources and I don't guess. Um, so if it's not there, I don't guess, but I would like to think that they were you know, they were each other's partners in, in love and in work. Um, I think it would be nice to see if we've got questions and comments coming from the audience as well. I could go on asking, but I'm sure other people have questions and ideas. Great, thank you both so much. This has been so fun um, and I'm just loving it. Okay. Um, I, Janice, I do have a question. Um, when you were doing your research, did you, f was there like one bit of information or little detail that you found at some point where, you, come on, this cannot possibly be true? Yeah. I, or something that really jumped out being so out there. <laughs> sure. I mean, I the, the thing that popped into my head is so disgusting, though. I'm, I'm not sure if you're going to want to, want me to go there. <laughs> You want me to go there? Yes, come on. <laughs> oh, people can mute if they feel it's too much. Right, right. I apologize to anyone who hasn't had dinner yet, but um, 
so I, I, as many of you may know, leeches were used as part of medical practice um, as, as a way of bleeding. Um, today, they're actually used again in, in, in yeah. very useful ways to, to, to debride dead tissue from say burn wounds or something like that. But back then leeches were used um, in bloodletting and they were used for um, gynecological bloodletting because they could get into tight spots. <laughs> So if the problem was, say, with the cervix and the doctor decided that it needed to be bled, they would take a leech and attach a string to its tail and let it make its way um, and do its work in the cervix and then pull it out again when it was full of blood. Um, I apologize if that just if that just lost <laughs> my audience, but that was definitely something that opened my eyes wide. <laughs> And there's a very funny thing because um, when Emily is is working in Edinburgh, and again, she's gotten to Edinburgh with no practical experience, and she's not talking about how little experience she has. And Dr. James Young Simpson, who's her boss, says, here, take this jar of leeches and make a house call and bleed the cervix. And she has never done this before. And, she's, and she, had, she writes a hysterical letter about how grateful she is that she went alone and no one was able to see how clumsily and fumblingly she did this operation on this poor woman. Um, yeah, that one, that one kept my attention. Okay, I'm now really glad that we live in the time that we live in now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so one of our audience members would like to know a little bit more about the jewelry designer who lives in the infirmary. Well, her name is Jill Platner, and um, and her work is exquisite. It, um, if you if you, um, I'll, 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 I'm putting her name in the chat, and you can look her up. Okay, terrific. Um, also, so you talk about how these two amazing women really paved the way for other women. Um, can you? Did that take off really fast after they were able to graduate, or did that take a lot longer for other women to uh, to catch up? Well, once they were able to found their own institution, they really were able to help other women who were thinking about wanting to study medicine because there was suddenly a, a place to get practical training. Most hospitals didn't want a woman, even with an MD, anywhere near them. So the practical experience that you needed, there was no way to get it. Um, once they had their hospital, um, young female medical graduates would pay, actually pay them for the privilege of like pay tuition a little bit, sort of a postgraduate tuition to work at the infirmary and, um, and become trained there. Um, that said, and this is another way in which the story is, is more complicated than the children's books would suggest, um, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell didn't have a very high opinion of most women. Um, even the medical ones, um, you had to be operating at a pretty high level to impress them. Um, and they dismissed a lot of people. I mean, I, uh, you know, Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman doctor. Emily Blackwell was the third. That always begs the question, well, who was the second? The second was a woman named Nancy Talbot Clark, who had actually gotten her degree at the same place that Emily did just before her. So at, as far as achievement level, had done the same thing, had achieved the same thing. Um, Elizabeth and Emily were remarkably wary of this woman who they always referred to as little Mrs. Clark and, and not in a nice way. Um, they, they kept their distance. They, you know, they respected her, but they really were wary of, the, of, of any, any danger that a woman not quite as excellent as they were might undermine the thing that they had struggled so hard to achieve. Um, this, I think, is pretty common among women who are pioneers in their field. Um, you know, I worked so hard to get here. You are not going to mess this up for me. And I don't know if you are good enough for me to trust you. I mean, we're still working with that today. So that, that felt very modern to me. Mm -hmm. And what did the other sisters do with their lives? Well, Anna, the oldest, was a journalist. Uh, she actually went back to Europe quite quickly as an adult and um, spent a great deal of time in Paris reporting back to America. Um, Ellen, the youngest sister, was a, a painter. She studied with Ruskin and Rosa Bonheur. She studied in Europe and then came back to teach painting. I'm not sure she was nearly as successful, but she made a go of it. Um, the fifth sister was sort of the, the hearth tender. She's the one who sort of looked after their mother and, and was the, the, the domestic center of the clan. 
And then the of the four boys, you know, Henry and Sam married those those trailblazing feminists, Lucy Stone and Nettie um, and Antoinette Brown. And then there were two more um, brothers. One went to work in the iron trade in England and died young. Uh, and one um, made good in real estate, which was a great boon to his less um, financially successful sisters, um, whom he helped support in their in their ventures. Oh wow! So they, I mean, that was a remarkable family, any which way you slice it. So, wow, <laughs> terrific. Um, well, I think that's. The questions from the audience. Perry, did you, did you have see, one more I question? The, I see one in the chat. Somebody, um, somebody oh, in the chat sorry. has asked, is there any connection to an established religious faith group of their day? Um, the, the Blackwells, as I said, the, the, they were raised as dissenters from the Church of England, so Protestants in an Anglican country. When they got here, they kept sort of seeking. Um, there's, there's a sort of a string of, of religious seekings that Elizabeth and to a certain extent Emily do. They, they sort of dabble with the Episcopalians and then they come back and then they get much more interested in the Unitarians. And I think the Unitarian direction is, um, is sort of where they end up, although they never are, um, they never are uh, affiliated with any specific church or pastor. They, they in, in sort of classic Blackwell style, they tend to believe that their own form of worship is the right form of worship, and they don't need anyone to tell them how to do it. Um, Elizabeth, though, um, you know, was very drawn to the Unitarians and a lot of the transcendentalist thinkers, um, and then also the, some, some utopian thinkers who were sort of part of that circle. Um, she, she spent a lot of time thinking about about ideal communities and about building her own ideal community. She, she, um, she was such an idealist that I think what she struggled with was that most humans she encountered didn't live up to her idea of what an excellent human should be. So even though she thought about creating her ideal community, she never really found people who were perfect enough to join her there. And I think that's both what got her where she ended up and so it was part of her triumph, but it was also part of her Poignance. Um, she ended up, I think, alone to a, to, a, to a great degree because she couldn't really connect to people who weren't perfect <laughs> in, in, in a way that most people aren't. <laughs> right. So a few more questions have come in. Um, uh, Mira would like to know, um, did they, and I'm guessing Emily and Elizabeth support themselves through medicine or was it from the money from the sugar plantation? But I think you said that the father died. No money from the sugar plantation. Um, yeah, the, the father died broke. Um, the, the oldest girls immediately sort of rescued the family via teaching um, and, scra and eventually scraped together enough money to start their medical educations. Later on, and there's sort of an inversion, I think the, the boys in the middle of the pack as they came of age and began to work, partly in gratitude to the sisters that had sort of rescued the family, um, were happy to support them in the early part of their venture. And then once they had founded the institutions in New York, there was a circle of wealthy donors who supported this idea of women's medical education, who supported their institutions. And then once the institutions existed, the state supported them to a certain, to, to a certain degree. They got the same grants that any medical establishment would get um, as a hospital, as a dispensary. Oh, great. Um, Judith would like to know, were women physicians accepted more in Paris and London than they were in America, or was it kind of the same? Uh, it was actually less so at the beginning. Um, Elizabeth and Emily received their medical degrees in America and then were followed by other women receiving medical degrees um, long before uh, medical degrees were granted to women in Paris and London. Um, women's medical colleges opened in Boston and Philadelphia in around 1850. Um, the first, um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first woman to receive uh, a medical degree from the Sorbonne in Paris, received it, I believe, in 1870. Um, so that's that's a gap. Um, and it's part of why the Blackwells decided to open their institutions in New York and not remain in Europe. I mean, I, to, they were both very drawn to England, where they had started out. But I think they recognized that New York, America was a better place to bash taboos than, than Europe at that point, um, which was mm. a little more rigid, especially England. Okay. Um, Ellen would like to know, if schools graduates 
work just at the inf at the infirmary in the school, or were they able to eventually go out and work in other hospitals? They well, it, it, interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, they weren't necessarily going out to work in other hospitals because, again, hospitals didn't really want female physicians there. Um, many of them went out as missionaries, as medical missionaries. Uh, you, when you look at the graduation rolls of the of the women's medical college, you see women going to China, women going to India, when you know women moving all over the world um, as part of the kind of 19th century civilizing mission um, that was religious, they could add a medical aspect to it. Um, we see some of that. Um, they also went to um, the women's hospitals that were opening in, in Boston and Philadelphia or went to teach at women's medical colleges. So staying within that kind of fold. Oh, fabulous. Well, I want to thank you both so much for your time on this. And Perry, I know that you obviously think highly of this book. So can you can you tell us in one sentence why we should all purchase a copy or at least read this, The Doctor's Blackwell? You really want to meet these women. <laughs> and you, you do. They're, they're not, uh, as, as Janice said, if you think you have a sense of who they are based on, you know, a story you heard when you were a kid. They're so much more interesting and they're so much more complicated. And what she's done in this book in using them to take you into their world and make you think about health and healing and gender is so remarkable. You really want to meet these women. Great, thank you. And for those of you at home, Thank you for your continued support of the Westport Library and our programs. If you'd like to purchase a copy of the Doctors Blackwell with a book plate signed by Janice, please follow the link that I've put in the chat or through the web page that you use to register for this event. We will keep it open now until 10 p.m. so you have a little time to go shopping. Um, please keep an eye on westportlibrary.org for our next Women's History event on March 22nd, when we will learn about EFA Manley um, and other programs coming up. This event and others are available to watch again through the library's YouTube channel. Thank you both so much for coming to Westport today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Perry. Thank you, Thank Jess. You,